Hello, everyone, participants online as well as in the office. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, as you must have seen over the invitation, this is Professor Lan Moore, who is going to be talking about the deliberations that took place in France. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Jason, our colleague, um, my colleague at IBP. But before that, I just want to say thank you for giving an introduction. Thank, thanks, Rod. Good morning, Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Move on to Professor Lanmore. Um, and then we will go on to a Q&A session. And for our participants online, I request uh, if you want to either enter your question in the chat box, please feel free so, uh, to do so, or just write your name and just say that you have a question and I will go to you and it will be on a first come first serve basis. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Jason. Thanks, Swad. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. In DC, yes? Yes, yeah. Great. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us this morning um, for, this, uh, for this webinar. Um, as you know, I'm just gonna give a little bit of background to why we're, why we're having this conversation and then turn it over to, uh, introduce Elaine and turn it over to, to her. Um, as you know, um, we've been, IBP has been, increasingly emphasizing public participation as one of our core uh, areas of work. And <clears throat> we've, there's a number of things that are going on, uh, including the revisions to the Open Budget Survey in recent years to include more participation questions and thinking about what kinds of mechanisms we want to measure through the survey. Um, there's the GIFT work, which involves piloting public participation mechanisms at the national level around budgeting in a number of countries. And so as we, as we think through what public participation looks like or should look like when we think about the budget, <clears throat> um, I think it's useful for us to connect to ongoing conversations and debates about public participation more broadly and how we can improve on the practices of uh, liberal democracy. So there's, there's a lot of discussion that's been happening around this outside of, not just within budgets, but outside of budgets and more broadly. And some of it is backward looking, looking to practices from the past, including practices from uh, ancient Greece that were more direct or that involved uh, different mechanisms for representation. And some of it is focused on modern experimentation around the world of the type that we know from participa participatory budgeting experiences, but also uh, other forms of uh, deliberation, deliberative polling, and so forth, some of which we've, we've discussed at different times uh, in meetings in, in the office. One of the challenges that we face in our work at IBP is thinking about deliberation um, at the national level. A lot of uh, participation experiments are local in nature and a lot of uh, participation around the budget in particular has been local in nature, sub-national level or even um, community level. And one of the conversations that we've been having with governments and as we think about the revisions to the survey is, is what participation looks like around budgets at the national level. So this idea of deliberation at scale, I think, is an important one that, we're, that we've been grappling with. And in this context, the recent French experience with the national, with the um, great national debate is an opportunity to reflect on a very recent experience with national deliberation, what that can look like, and what we might be able to learn about the possibilities and limitations of, of different approaches. So that's kind of the motivation for our discussion today. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Alain. Um, uh, Alain and I went to graduate school many years ago, and um, at that time it was already, I think, pretty obvious who was going to become the famous professor and who was going to be introducing the famous professor. But here we are. <laughs> um, Alain is a professor of political science at Yale, and she's been doing a lot of work on um, 
and is, and is finishing her second book now on open democracy and the concept of open democracy, which I think is highly relevant for our thinking about not just transparency, but participation and what it means to engage the public uh, more meaningfully in all, all manner of uh, politics and policy decisions. Um, she's currently, she's been doing work uh, research on the uh, great national debate, which she'll talk about today and is also involved in doing research on the follow on to the great national debate, which is a deliberative, uh, another kind of deliberative mini public that's looking at climate change in France uh, over a six month period. So she could also um, reflect on that with us. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Professor Landemar. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for the very generous introduction. I think the reason why I became a professor is because I had no other choice as a political theorist. We don't have any other uh, practical world uh, sort of options. <laughs> but thank you anyway. Um, so, and also thank you for allowing me actually to basically be in touch with people who do things in the real world. I think I, my, as my sort of, uh, career tra trajectory evolves, I'm more and more interested in, in applying uh, my ideas or you know, theoretical ideas by other democratic theorists. So it's really a, an honor, a pleasure, and I'm very grateful. So um, I'm going to guide you to the, uh, the, sorry, where did it get started? The, the great national debate in France, which was the most exciting thing that has happened to France in a long time, in my view. Can you see? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, I should get this started. Okay, is that, is that good? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I subtitled it Toward a Republic of Permanent Deliberation because it's a phrase that President Macron himself used and I, I thought it was really uh, interesting and it shows to me that the, the paradigm of deliberative democracy has reached a certain maturity. Uh, that an, another sure sign that this deliberative democracy paradigm has reached maturity is that the Financial Times recently had an um, op-ed by the editorial team that said that deliberative democracy was the solution to the crisis of democracy, or something along those lines. Which was quite quite surprising. Um, so um, so basically, ideas that were you know utopian, uh, impra seen as impractical thirty years ago, are now seen as on the contrary, practical um, you know, sources of solutions. So it's, it's really inspiring. So I'm not going to dwell on the current political reality. We're facing a crisis of democracy, the Trump election, Brexit, the rise of populism, and authoritarianism. But it's also a crisis for uh, democratic theorists because I think we've realized our normative models of democracy don't work very well anymore. So I, I'm just going to give you an example. Um, Habermas' two-track model of the public sphere has been very influential on, uh, on deliberative Democrats. And I think we've seen the, the limits of that model. And I feel like to some degree, the, the, the French um, experience, uh, French experiment has been an, an effort to uh, transform or improve that model. So what's that model? It's basically the idea that we have uh, two tracks in a functional deliberative democracy. You have the what, calls, what Habermas calls track one, the place of formal decision making where politicians, elected officials, uh, courts, and all kinds of administrations make decisions for us, the larger public, because you cannot have um, proper deliberation leading to decision making, but in these more structured and constrained settings. But it's surrounded by what Habermas calls deliberation in the wild. So the deliberation that takes place at, you know, in coffee shops, or in taxis, um, uh, at the kitchen table, etc., uh, in, the, in the media, through op-eds and, and on, on TV. And that deliberation in the wild is supposed to sort of magically set the agenda for the deliberation, the more formal and decision-making uh, uh, you know, deliberations happening in track one. But of course, it's absolutely not what we observe. What we find is that um, track two is very dysfunctional at the moment. It's polarized. It's uh, um, you know uh, infected by by, by tr trolls. It's uh, it's segmented. Uh, there's no actual agenda setting uh, that that that's really done. Or if it's done, it's done in a in a in a, in a biased way. And so we have a breakdown of the 
a relationship Habermas imagined between track one and track two with a lack of representativeness of the decisions that are made in track one and a growing frustration in, in track two and, and a growing sense that we don't know how to talk to each other, right? So my argument is uh, going to be that I think the French great national debate was an attempt to solve the problem by creating a third structured, deliberative, but crucially non-decisive track between track one and track two. So it's an innovation, but it's not a revolution, right? We're not handing over power to the people directly. We're creating a third structured, deliberative track. And we're trying to scale, basically, deliberation, the kind of deliberation we know works, to the larger population at the national level. So if you picture it this way, uh, I, I'm terrible at uh, you know, creating graphs, but I think it gives you an idea. You, ex you basically insert an additional layer between track one and track two, a space where it's not deliberation in the wild, it's not unorganized and hierarchic. So it lacks a certain freedom, but it's, it has the benefits of being structured and, and uh, to be able to lead to some clean proposal that can then be taken up by track one. So Habermas worried that when you structure deliberation that way, you basically constrain it in ways that are um, ultimately counterproductive. But I, I think it's a trade-off that we, we now have to face and, uh, and I actually think it's a, it's a move in the right direction overall. So what I'm gonna talk about uh, is basically, first I'm gonna give you the, the, the facts and figures about the great national debate, because to my surprise, it's not been discussed all that much um, in the foreign media. We've had, there has been a lot of coverage of the Yellow Vest Revolt, but not really of the national answer that was given to it by, by Macron. And I'll focus on three participatory elements that I think are particularly, or you know, were particularly important in that case. Uh, the online platform, the local meetings, they're called real, uh, it's an acronym for, um, uh, actually I forgot what it's an acronym for, I'll have to look again. And the regional assemblies, which were uh, randomly selected uh, all, around, all across the country. And there were 21 of them. And then in a, in a, in a shorter uh, sort of concluding phase, I'll, I'll go over the, the lessons that we can derive from that, uh, from that unique uh, experiment. Everybody's following so far? Yes. Yes? Okay. Um, so the great national debate. Um, so it started as not really a choice. It started as, as an answer to a social political crisis uh, triggered by the Yellow Vest revolts, right? So you may have seen the pictures of those people in neon um, vests gathering on traffic circles throughout the country basically recreating what we, we could call uh, the equivalent of uh, deliberative spaces like coffee, coffee shops you know, in the 18th century, because finally they, they got together and talked to each other uh, to fight this, this feeling of um, frustration and uh, isolation. And, and that came as, as a reaction to a tax on gas that Macron had tried to pass and uh, that basically infuriated people who have to drive to work and live in rural areas. And even though the, so basically this was a, a reaction by, by a fraction of the, of the population, the periphery, the, the you know, uh, lower to middle class uh, people, it, it garnered the support of at one point 80% of the population. So it was a, something that was perceived as, as, a, as a popular movement, widely justified. It got ugly quite quickly though, um, because some fraction of, of the demonstrators started to be violent. They burned down the frickets that you see um, down there, the restaurant where, for example, Sarkozy celebrated his election some years back. And that was seen as, as a symbol of the oligarchy. Right? That, so there's also, in France, in France at the moment, you know, this vocabulary of the 1%, the 99%, the oligarchy versus the people. I mean, the same, the same sort of populist uh, polarization that we see occur in many countries. They demonstrated on the, on the Champs-Élysées, they also broke down and damaged some, some public furniture there. So uh, Macron actually did what I think was the only thing and, and really the right thing he could do, uh, say, look, let's talk to each other, let's calm down, take a you know, time out and all think about what's going on and how we can fix the situation. And apparently this was uh, suggested to him by Ségolène Royal, it's not an information that I have verified directly, but I wouldn't be surprised because Ségolène Royal, who is a former uh, unlucky candidate to the presidency, um, is the only politician so far who was really convinced of you know, this theme of collective intelligence and evolving people and, 
and doing you know, things like mini public. So he penned, so Macron uh, penned a letter to the nation saying that he wanted us to, he wanted the French to basically spend two months talking to each other about four themes. The four themes were organization of the state, fiscal justice, um, democracy and citizenship, and the environment. Right? He excluded on purpose, purposefully, uh, purposely immigration because it was seen as a too, um, too, too difficult topic and too dangerous. So, and, and the first meeting he organized was with uh, 700 mayors, the, the only elected officials who have still some credibility in France, uh, who are still liked, according to polls. And he met with them and he answered their question for like six hours and a half in a row. So it was a pretty spectacular uh, beginning of this great national debate. Although if you look at this picture, I think you'll see that the optics are not that great. You see a lot of middle-aged white guys. Um, and so it's not exactly what deliberative Democrats have in mind when they think of inclusive deliberation. So that, that was a good move in terms of a mediatization of the process because the cameras were there, was followed by newspapers, radio, et cetera, all, all of the media. But it's not clear that this was the right um, implementation of the idea of a republic of permanent deliberation a phrase that he used for the first time at, at this meeting in, in Normandy, actually at Bourges. So uh, the fact is that the, the timeline was incredibly rushed. All the people I talked to in, in France it was a nightmare. They had uh, less than a month to put things together um, at the national scale and, and pull this off. So it took place between January 15th and March 15th, with one, one week extension because some of the regional assemblies had to last until March 25th. Some of the um, you know, controversial aspects of the process um, include the fact that the government excluded a body called the CNDP, which is a, a body devoted to the promotion of public debate in France. But somehow, uh, the government feared losing control of the process or feared that the, the, you know, the people that said the CNDP were too slow moving or too academic in their way of thinking. And I got different stories uh, about why this relationship broke down. So instead, in order to guarantee the impartiality of the process, uh, government chose to appoint five public figures as uh, guarantors of the process. So they, they, uh, they, they, they sort of made sure that the process was transparent. So for example, they emphasized uh, the open data dimension of the process. They also went to some of the meetings to check that nothing was uh, controlled by government, etc. And again, there was a constraint agenda of four themes only. So there are actually seven really interesting participatory features to this great debate. I'm only going to talk about three, the online platform, the local meetings, um, and the regional assemblies. But there are really four more that include the mails and emails that were sent by uh, citizens to government, a total of 16, uh, over, over 16,000 emails and mails. The grievance book, so we revive a French tradition that, you know, back to the uh, French Revolution. So people went to their city hall and wrote down grievance books, basically, uh, where they complained about you know, the effect of laws, their situation, inequalities, all kinds of things. There were also so-called stand de proximité, so terminal, terminals in train stations and post offices, <laughs> banned by volunteers, bureaucrats, and, and students that were paid to basically collect uh, the opinions of people that might have not made it to the city halls or the other meetings. Uh, and so including, uh, you know, homeless people, uh, people who hang out in train stations and, you know, people like that. And finally, there was a, a set of national thematic conferences uh, meant to bring together intermediary bodies like unions, uh, NGOs, uh, all kinds of uh, intermediary bodies that had felt quite excluded by this move to reach out to the people directly and, and had expressed a desire to be included as well. So they had their own four assemblies, the number of participants and, and, and proposals that, that came out of these meetings. So again, I'm not going to talk about them. I, I want to spend time instead on, on the, the participatory method that, that generated the most uh, uh, participation and content. So the online platform uh, was like the first thing that was made available the government very quickly put together this, this platform so you can see what it looked like. Uh, and you can see that uh, here uh, you have the, the summary of the number of contributions, you know, contributions understood in a broad sense, meaning it goes from clicking uh, like on, on 
on a contribution to you know, writing down a long post. Uh, it summarized also the other elements of the of the of the great debate. So you had ten thousand uh, local meetings, sixteen thousand uh, grievance books, and about ten thousand mail or, or emails. So I said that, but it's basically the place that centralized the information about the great national debate. So it was a necessary portal in many ways. Uh, the problem is that it was poorly thought through from the beginning. So uh, one, uh, of course, it, uh, it uh, only uh, you know, attracted a certain kind of people. So self-selection led to a huge bias in who actually contributed to the website. It also had, and that's the thing that I find most incomprehensible, it had no deliberative feature whatsoever. So we want to create a republic of permanent deliberation, and all you can do is enter your input into the system. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually not clear whether this is an oversight at the beginning when everything was rushed or an intentional, a first intentional effort at keeping things under control and, and, and avoiding, you know, some, some kind of escalation between participants. So as I said, there were 1.9 million contributions, uh, 2.8 million visitors. It's very hard to estimate actually how many people uh, were active participants, was most likely around half a million. And... Uh, that, that generated so much contempt that, in fact, to this day, the results haven't been fully uh, analyzed, right? Uh, the, the, I mean, the, the views, I, I, if, you, if we have time, I'll talk about the synthesis and how all that data, about 100,000 pages of PDF uh, was, was analyzed, but there's still a lot more to be done. So the, the content will go to the National Archives and should, you know, should provide a material for researchers for years to come. So the local meetings, so the local meetings were basically uh, meetings like this one that the government said, look, you people go and organize your own meetings in city halls and, and uh, you know, uh, your living room, uh, all kinds of, uh, it, it's a free, free for all sort of free form sort of meeting. So uh, 10,000 were organized against uh, only 2,000 were expected. Many of them, maybe half, were actually organized by politicians, elected officials, many in the Macron sort of uh, line. But a lot of them came, came up spontaneously. I mean, they, they just people felt the need to talk to each other, so they, they organized their own meetings. So as we can see, again, self-selection leads to an overrepresentation of older people, people who are retired, uh, people who are educated, uh, who tend to be also male. Uh, so. It, it's a form of participation that has its limits. I attended a couple of meetings because there was no structured deliberation format and no, no facilitator in particular. The usual uh, gender dynamics, uh, you know, played out. Um, they passed over, you know, women, minorities, etc. But it's still, it was still very productive. The conversation I've seen are, you know, it, it, it was sophisticated. It was respectful. Um, in fact, there are, there are no reports of any incidents during the duration of, of all these meetings. Um, additionally, the government asked people to write up a summary of their meetings and to upload it on the government website. So that's what it looks like. If you, if you go online, you can click on, a, on a, you know, a, the, meet, the, the summary of a, the bourg en bresse meeting and you get a, a one page that tells you exactly what was said, what happened, uh, the conclusion that, that were reached, etc. So it's a really useful um, material here again to, to get a sense of the, the people's mood in France and, and the, the, the demands. Unfortunately, um, nobody counted the number of participants. Another huge oversight that, uh, you know, officials justify by saying that we didn't want people to feel uh, controlled and uh, monitored. But the result is that we, we just don't know how many people really participated. So we know that there were between 9,300 9, meetings and, and 10,000. Um, I think, think the number is closer to 10,000 at this point. Uh, again, widely above the expectations of government. Around 500,000 estimated participants, 700,000 according to impartial guarantors. But the method they use to evaluate that are very... Uh, and scientific, so it's unclear. Uh, it happened, they, these meetings happen in under 5,000 cities, including in our, uh, you know, former colonies, uh, territories beyond the seas, as we call them. Um, 
and among expatriates as well, there was a meeting in New York, for example, that I didn't get a chance to go to, but I, I know happened. So it's about one city out of eight that was, um, you know, concerned by these meetings. And, and uh, that's to compare, for example, with uh, the one out of two cities uh, being the, the, a site to write a grievance book. So it affected uh, under 1% of the metropolitan population. 61% of the population had the opportunity of accessing a local meeting less than 20 kilometers away from them. So it sounds like it was really inclusive in many ways. The truth is though that half the French live in small towns, so cities um, smaller than 10,000 inhabitants, and they have only access to one option. Additionally, uh, correlation has been observed between the density of meetings and the Macron vote in the last presidential election. So critics obviously say that this was a lot, you know, um, it, it was a lot of Macron supporters in those meetings and not necessarily the entirety of uh, the, 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 the diversity of the whole, the whole country. Um, there were two types of meetings. Some were open, anybody could show up. Some were closed. They were reserved to a certain type of, of people. So formats for free. Uh, the government tried to help to at least give some basic structure to the meeting by sending methodological kits, which basically consisted in guidelines like uh, do not proselytize, be, re be respectful, uh, you know, uh, make sure to write down the, the summary of the, um, the discussion. Uh, so I'll just keep over those, those facts. If you're interested, you can, you can look into it. All of these figures actually are available on the government website. So you'll find a lot of that information already in, in French, but uh, available on, on the government's website. So the demography now, so we've made some progress on, on who uh, participated. As you can see, it's, an, uh, it's a pretty uh, high uh, average age, 57 year old on average. Uh, a little bit more men than women, 50%, 55% men. Half of them were retired people. It's a huge problem in France. We have a very hard time getting young, young people to care and be invested. Many of them were working people. And so we have a, a, an under representation of the youth and the professionally um, active people between 30 and 40 year olds, probably because you're busy raising our kids among other things. The population was also very educated, uh, mostly people that were property owning. And many of them said they were doing well financially. So in a way, what we got in those self-selected uh, you know, meetings based on self-selection were people who are the opposite profile from the Yellow Vest, the people who had triggered the need for a national debate in the first place. That's a bit sovereign. So the better news is, that, um, I think, in the regional assemblies, because those were based on random selection, and uh, they got a much more diverse sample of the population. There were 21 of them, which is quite remarkable if you think about it, like just the scope of it and the logistical nightmare that this has represented for the organizers. They took place in 13 regions of France um, with one additional um, assembly taking place in the metropolis for the youth exclu exclusively because the government realized that they wouldn't get them to join those groups otherwise. And then there were um, seven more uh, in the territories beyond the sea, our, our former colonies, um, where uh, I actually went to, to, to attend one of them and observe them, and it, it turns out they were not truly random. Um, there was a lot less investment in doing the, the, the selection process well, and so I'm not sure they neatly compare with the, the other ones. Um, but it was still interesting to, to see the kind of um, conversation that took place in those, in those uh, territories, because they have very specific needs and, uh, and problems, uh, many of them linked to climate change, actually. So in total, these uh, regional assemblies uh, included uh, over 1,400 participants who generated 230 collective proposals of varying quality, but many of them quite sophisticated by my assessment. Uh, it was demanding in terms of uh, structure and, and uh, you know, animation. So you had 32 animators, and 195 facilitators. So facilitators were people who took care of, um, uh, you know, individual groups of, of six to seven people. And there were 19 fact checkers that people could consult. Um, those fact checkers, I, I, my experience of, of observing them was that they were completely pointless and not very helpful because all they did was basically use Google and answer questions that way. 
other people had a, had a more um, productive experience with, with them also, they were quite useful. So if you look at the map of France, you see that um, the number of participants were varied. Uh, on average, I mean, the, the, the government expected about 100 per, per meeting, randomly selected people, but it ranged from the lowest number is Guadeloupe with 19 people, uh, and the highest is probably uh, Ile de France, so in Paris, basically, where you know the, the, the media attention was, and, and people are probably uh, more invested in politics anyway, uh, with 125 participants. And I attended the one in Normandy right there, and the, the one in, in Martinique. Yeah. So what they looked like is something like this. So you know they met in these big uh, hallways or, or you know meeting places. Some of them nicer. For example, the Parisian one was really nice. Uh, the one in Normandy, not so much. It was very noisy and, and uh, a bit uh, dreary. Uh, but you can see that the, the, the setup was quite uh, egalitarian, with round tables, inclusive. You had a uh, yellow vest that joined the, the, that joined the deliberations. You had a parity of women, for the most part. Uh, you had uh, younger people. You had uh, uh, what we call visible minorities in France, even though we're not supposed to statistically uh, document them. Uh, the polling institute managed to make sure they were present in, uh, at the tables. So that's the one in. Uh, that's a picture of um, a set of pictures from the one in Martinique, uh, which was much smaller, only 28 people. And you can see, uh, I took a picture of the way they did the, um, the assignment um, to the table. So there were two boxes, one for men, one for women. And you picked, uh, everybody picked one coin, uh, one token uh, out of four. I mean, uh, there was four colors and, and the colors determined which theme you were going to debate, whether it was democracy and citizenship or, or the environment or the organization of the state or fiscal justice. And they use classic techniques of world cafes and, and other things, uh, post-its and, uh, you know, trying to move from the diagnosis of a problem to the formulation of a solution and then the vote on, on those solutions. So it was very convivial. Uh, there was a time set apart for, for socialization, for, for dinners, for, for uh, basically bonding between the participants. And the meeting lasted um, from Friday night to uh, Sunday afternoon. It was quite demanding in terms of the time of the participants. So the random selection, I, I'm, I'm just going to briefly talk about it. Uh, it was quite imperfect. Um, the yield, uh, the, the take-up rate was very low, under 10% in the end. So if you compare with the gold standard of many publics, for example, Jim, Fishkin, uh, Jim Fishkin's deliberative polls, uh, which claim to have a take-up rate of 80%, it's actually really low. And I think the, the mistake here was, one, not to advertise the process more. I think the government was doing that for the first time, it was very shy about screwing it up, so they didn't talk about it that much. The media didn't cover the, the, the process or later the, the regional assemblies either. Um, and most importantly, in my view, they didn't pay the participants. So um, Fishkin, for example, usually pays its, its participants some, some, sometime uh, up to a hundred dollars. He also pays for uh, um, things like um, daycare to incentivize women to show up. The government in France, and it's a very cultural thing, uh, decided that they were not going to pay anyone because they didn't want to be perceived, especially by the Yellow Vest, as buying and corrupting the people. So the result is that the take-up rate was quite low. The methodology used during those meetings was also interesting. And my, my, my problem with it, if you will, is that based on the practice, experience, and intuition of basically two, uh, they're not uh, NGOs, but they're private institutions uh, that run these kind of participatory experiments for the government, Respublica and Mission Public. They are amazing people. I, I've met and interviewed many of them. I have great respect and admiration for them. But the reality is that they apply uh, things they've done for many years without, I feel, a lot of um, scientific evidence to justify their choices. So it's a, it's a sort of a prudential you know, knowledge that they apply, but we don't have enough knowledge uh, at the scientific level about whether any of this actually works. So anyway, so they followed this protocol. Day one uh, was from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. with icebreakers, 
a long, completely unnecessary, in my view, PowerPoint about the Grand Debat's preliminary result that was plugged in at the last minute by governments. And then they went on to have uh, individual and collective diagnostics of a problem, mood boards. And then the second day was the day when they had to identify a solution, start uh, move around from table to table, have plenary sessions to complicate and refine the ideas. And eventually they formulated proposals that were put to a vote by table at the end of the day. So that's the protocol that was used absolutely everywhere. Um, and it looked like this. Uh, people enjoyed it overall. I, uh, the, that's uh, the beauty of it. So here's an example of um, the sort of a cloud, uh, you know, the word cloud that they got when it was time to do the individual diagnostics. So if you look at, um, for example, the fourth one here, um, uh, on democracy and citizenship, you have uh, respect, participation, freedom, equality, but also things like uh, what we call white votes, so people who decide to cast a blank vote. Mm -hmm. That's a big issue in France. People, there's an important fraction of the population who think that those blank votes should be counted. Um, when, when, it's a, when, when we go to the climate, on, climate on, um, on the environment, you see that the biggest word is emergency, urgence. Um, uh, and smaller words like nuclear power uh, also come up. So that, that these were the methods that were used. So now you might ask, were these assemblies a success? So my assessment is that there were a couple of things that worked really nicely. So first of all, people cared. And very few left. I actually witnessed um, a farmer who had to get up at 5 a.m. every day to uh, basically make his cells and be able to make it by nine to the meeting, who was really furious after the first night because he couldn't take the sort of brainwashing uh, of the PowerPoint about the great debate, which, which is exactly how most people perceived it. So he left saying he was not going to come back. And then he came back the next day. And when we asked him why, he said, well, I cared about my, uh, the people at my table. I just didn't want to disappoint them. Uh, so very quickly, there was a bonding that happened at, at each table that there was sort of a, you know, generally happening everywhere. So they were also mostly successful in going from ideas to proposals. And I, I think that's not a small feat because they only had two days and a half about big issues. And uh, the fact that the, the that, that's also to the credit of the organizer, that they managed to, you know, facilitate the conversation to the point that they, that they actually followed all the steps and produced concrete proposals. So the things that didn't work, uh, the random selection process, in my view, is, it wasn't done very, very well. Um, if only because, for example, there were people who chose the color of the chip that they were given uh, uh, based on what they thought would be the theme, so that ruins the randomization process. There was not enough diversity still, even with the randomization, because they didn't pay them, because they didn't aggressively try to recruit them, I think. There was some problem with the acoustics and the architecture of some rooms. Um, and also, I think there was too much micromanagement, especially by government the first day, again, with this plug of a PowerPoint that was completely uh, pointless, but also by the, um, the, the, the facilitators. I think France is really a country where we don't trust people, and so we have to micromanage at all levels, and that really was on display in those meetings. There were no, also no access to experts, not that the people in the meetings would have had time to consult them, to be honest, but it felt like people were deliberating on the basis of no real objective information, and I think that's, that's a problem. And finally, the final uh, voting on, on proposals by table ended up humiliating some people because they, they felt like they had worked really hard and that they came last like, a, like, a, like, like, like bad students, if you will. So I, I heard many complain about that. Um, my view also, so that's my perspective as a researcher, a huge limitation is that this, um, you know, this whole great debate costs 11 million euros and the government won't say how much the regional assemblies themselves cost, but they're probably in a couple of million, obviously one of the more expensive parts of the process. And they refuse to introduce an experimental dimension, meaning uh, allowing researchers to suggest some differences of treatment in the way conversation were uh, led in, say, different assemblies or uh, at the level of subgroups within each assembly. So basically, you, you didn't have the possibility to do this thing you know, where you have a, a treatment group and a control group, and you can tell you know, the effect of, of, of the treatment um, uh, in, in a relatively scientific and precise manner. 
So basically, millions of euros are, were wasted in terms of improving our social scientific knowledge of what works or not, and, and I find this particularly heartbreaking. We could have learned things about the effect of group composition. We could have learned things about the effect of more or less facilitation, more or less uh, you know, micromanagement. We could have learned things about the effect of the gender of the facilitator, about whether you know, it's better to um, incentivize uh, the display of emotions or, on the contrary, control of emotions. So we've, we've learned nothing from the point of view, and that's, that's a great loss. loss. And the reason that was given to me, because I was in one of the meetings where I tried to, you know, at the beginning when they were organizing things, where I tried to push for introducing this experimental dimension. So one, I think it's cultural again. There's no culture of uh, randomly controlled trials in France. So when, when you talk about these things, I'm not sure the people really understand what we're talking about. And second, there was this pushback by the bureaucrats saying, no, 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 we have to respect the principle of Republican equality, if we treat different groups differently, we are going to be accused of, uh, you know, um, again, violating the principle of Republican equality. So that, that was the pushback we got. So I'm critical, but at the same time, I want to point out the good, good aspects of this uh, uh, randomly selected assemblies. They managed to involve people who never participated in anything before. If you look at this uh, bar right here, 60% almost 61% of the participants said they had never participated in anything before. So that's quite remarkable. So that's a very different profile from, from the um, self-organized meetings, for example, or the people who showed up online. Also, people who participated generally expressed, expressed a great degree of satisfaction uh, about their experiences in those meetings, even as most of them said they didn't expect that this would lead to any kind of real change. So, uh, so this is the, the indicator for the global satisfaction for this regional uh, conference, 7.8 out of 10, which is quite remarkable. Um, and they appreciated the facilitation, the quality of exchanges among citizens, etc. The, the lowest uh, um, grade went to the rhythm, the pace of it, which was really intense, and the uh, information received uh, given by government during those meetings, which was um, a little bit more disappointing to them. So let me now turn to uh, the conclusions and lessons learned, right? Um, uh, and I title this Toward Open Democracy because beyond this Republic of Permanent Deliberation, my hope is that we can actually envision something even bolder than what uh, Macron uh, envisioned in this particular French case. So first, let's you know, um, sort of summarize the, 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 what happened in France. What happened is that uh, at least 500,000 people were involved in local meetings. Up to 1.5 million people contributed online. So um, that's potentially 2 million people that were genuinely uh, involved in this deliberative process at the mass scale. Uh, there was also a high rate of uh, uh, proposal per 100,000 inhabitants, 746, compared, to be compared with the Brazilian experience in 1988 when um, the ratio was 88 to 100,000 inhabitants. And Iceland was recently with the Icelandic constitutional process of 2010 when, um, sorry, I forgot to put the number, but I think it's 137. So it's really, uh, it was quite productive. And then I didn't get a chance to talk about this, and I won't unless you want me to mention it in the Q&A, but there were also very interesting ripple effects of the great debate in the larger society. So if you think of this, third, uh, of this um, second track, which lacks structure, well, under the influence of the great debate, it sort of structured itself. So the Yellow Vests resented uh, Macron. They didn't want to, so many of them didn't want to take part in the great debate. So what they did, they organized with their own means um, a, what they called a true debate that uh, included about 45,000 participants and generated 25,000 propositions. And that's also an interesting uh, dimension of, of doing these experiments is that they do have ripple effects in the larger population. So all in all, at least 1.5% of the population participated in some fashion. It's not enormous, obviously. Again, it's not really mass deliberation in the sense uh, that we think of uh, mass voting, for example, where you'd expect at least half the population to show up in a, in a referendum. 
but it's quite, quite remarkable compared to uh, similar experiments. Um, so the distinctive features of the great national debate compared to, um, again, uh, the Icelandic experiment, the Brazilian experience, experiments, is that the scale and time uh, on which it was organized is quite remarkable. Um, uh, the, the money put into it was, was also quite remarkable. So as I said, it cost 11 million euros. Many people thought it was too much. I actually think it was probably too little, um, but it's, it's still a substantial amount of, of money. And the speed at which it was organized is also remarkable. What's quite unique is the articulation of various methods. So you had the online um, uh, components, you had the mini public components, you had uh, um, the other aspect, the mailing and, and the emailing, you had a sort of interesting articulation of various participatory modules. I'm not sure the, the, the particular sequence or the particular articulation of this module was the best. For example, uh, there was a very timid attempt at, at um, uh, connecting the, the, the regular meetings with the regional assemblies, right? But through the summary and through the PowerPoint summary of government, so the, the, the results of those early meetings was conveyed through a couple of charts to the participants in mini public. So that was awkward, that was not done well. I don't think it was successful. But the idea that we should um, articulate the findings of and the, the, the contribution generated in each module is actually interesting. And the yellow vests actually were a lot more in, inventive and bold in their own um, generate their own counter debates. So they, what they tried to do is have a bunch of um, assemblies working in parallel and in, in a sequential manner uh, by transferring conclusions uh, from one to the other and connecting through various means. So I think we can be a lot more imaginative than the French government was. And most importantly, uh, they, they really tried hard not to lose any voice and any information. I, I don't have time to talk about that now, but it's particularly visible in the way they synthesize the results. They, the, they used methods to render the content, try to make sure not a single argument, not a single piece of information, not a single view contributed by citizens was lost. So no averages, no, I mean, there were averages, but an attempt to, to keep the fine grained nature of the contributions to the end. And finally, from the French uh, perspective, I think it's really important what happened because it entrenched participatory principles in French culture. Um, and I do agree with uh, whoever said there will be a before and an after. I think it was Macron could be uh, Louis Philippe, the prime minister. I think this is really a, a, a profound change in, uh, in the culture of, of uh, the political culture of France. At least I, I hope it will have long, long lasting, uh, a long-lasting impact. So now I also try to summarize what I see as the weaknesses and the strength. So on, on, on the side of weaknesses, it's clear that it was too rushed and too improvised in some parts. I think that explains some of the design mistakes, like uh, the lack of a deliberative feature on the online platform, the fact that the participants were unpaid, uh, the participants in the random assemblies were unpaid. It's also clear that we have a cult of personality problem in France and that Macron was too present throughout, that took away from the focus on citizens. In fact, if you Google great national debate in France, what do you get? You get a picture of Macron with the mayors. And that kind of meeting with the mayors is not officially part of the great national debate. So what you should get inside, instead uh, are pictures of ordinary citizens in those you know, uh, meetings or randomly uh, selected assemblies that I talked to you about. Uh, I think they didn't think about the criteria of legitimacy they wanted to respect, whether it was representativeness of the sample of people involved, whereas it were, whether it was the quality of the proposals, none of that was really thought through. There was no counting of participants, as I already mentioned. We have no information about the online participants. Um, and in the end, you could also sort of fault the process for not giving real decision power to the people. And to this day, the causal impact of this great national debate uh, as yet to be measured, right? So one thing that it, that it had, um, one clear impact it had is that it led Macron to embrace the convention, the, the principle of a convention on, on climate change that is now taking place uh, this fall, starting on October 4th and to 6th. 
So it had, it's, it's clear that the, the process had an impact, but is it, is it an impact that's proportional to the investment of time and, and money that this has represented? Uh, it's, it's less clear. Again, the fact that there was no experimental dimension to me seems like a, a massive squandering of opportunity. And basically, if I were to summarize all those weaknesses, they come down to one thing is that they don't trust the people enough. They don't trust them to uh, participate. They don't trust them to contribute good ideas. They don't trust them to make decisions in the end. And they don't trust them to accept the fact that this is an experiment for all of us and that we have a lot to learn and that it would be fine to uh, let researchers play around with the format a little. Now, in terms of the strength, obviously, the ambition, the, the, the boldness of the scheme is, is uh, to be commended. The fact that it has implanted the vocabulary of deliberative democracy uh, in, in, the, in the culture and an official jargon of politicians. Uh, strategically, it was a smart answer to the crisis. Um, we haven't had a, a yellow vest demonstration so far, which is quite remarkable because now we are into September and I, I was expecting them to flare up again, but they haven't. Uh, another good aspect is that even though they failed to include uh, researchers as much as they should have in the design, they did make use of so, so relatively good social scientific knowledge uh, on, on, on some aspects. So the CNDP, CNDP even though it was a uh, sideline at the beginning, contains a lot of very good people who are really well informed about deliberative democracy and so they've been able to to some degree, shape the process. Uh, so I already said a lot of the other positive points. Um, the relative transparency is also a good thing. So that's uh, something that might be interesting if you want to apply that to budget. So all the data is available um, publicly on the government website. I'll add a caveat though, because they said they would do that, but then it turns out that um, a lot of people revealed their address, their name, their birth date on the, in the comments. So by law, the government is not able to actually put all of the data, all of the raw data back on the website. Uh, but they refuse to pay for a cleaning up of the data. And, and so, yes, there is open data, but it's, it's, uh, it's not complete, if you know. So all in all, I still think that it's a real step forward for France um, and that it could be a source of inspiration for other countries. Uh, well, in terms of what, what we've learned, if this were to be tried again elsewhere, clearly political will matter. Um, if Macron had not been seriously invested in this, if he hadn't attracted media attention, um, this would not have worked. This would not have had the visibility that in France. But we still verify that it's very hard for government to really trust its people and let go of control. In my view, there was too much micromanagement, uh, at least in the regional assemblies. It would have been nice to have more media coverage. I'm not sure why, but the media only followed Macron up to a point. So if they, they followed him to the meeting with the mayors, but they only showed up sporadically to the regional assemblies, for example. Um, so again, it's, it's another thing that, that needs to be thought through, how to involve the media properly. And of course, the question of design and architecture matters. I think uh, they could have made an effort to choose rooms that were not so noisy or, or uh, also dreary sometimes. Um, that there's still a lot uh, to improve. So now, to go back to this question, to these more theoretical questions, and I'm almost done, I promise. Was this a case of mass deliberation or deliberation at scale? Uh, one could have hoped that this would be the case, but the reality is that we ended up with only a percent of the population and groups that were basically small clusters of self-selected or randomly selected groups. Um, so you can't really say it was deliberation um, at the mass scale, but it does re represent the kind of expansion of structural public deliberation outside track one that I've been that I talked about at the beginning. And the also the, the other important thing is that it had ripple effects on deliberation in the wild among the rest of the citizenry. And I don't think it was just the yellow vest. I think people again in in, uh, in, in taxi cabs uh, at the kitchen table and coffee shops talked about the great debate, talked about the issues. And that's very hard to measure. It's a much more diffuse um, phenomenon, but I think it really um, improved the quality of our democracy in those months when, when the great debate happened. So again, so what I, see, what I see the great debate as having done is uh, created this intermediary track where you can have a structured deliberation that 
may provide for better agenda setting for track one, because in the end, you know, again, you have 100,000 pages of PDF that contain a lot of information that the, the, the parliament should be able, or the government should be able to process and, and perhaps implement. The open questions for uh, both researchers and, and practitioners, are, I suppose, are that we don't know whether this would work with a more open agenda, right? In the French case, we only had four questions. Was it too little, as the critics pointed out? Was it already too much, as the government uh, argued? We don't know what the ideal length of something like this is. We don't know what the ideal frequency of something like this is. Probably it cannot be too frequent because it's, it's basically, basically politics was on pause for three months in France, right? Uh, it, it took a lot of energy um, and, uh, and time uh, for organizers and citizens alike. We also don't know how best to articulate the different forms of participation, these various modules I've talked about. And we also don't know how to synthesize properly the total input because how do you weigh the views of people who join, uh, you know, self-selected uh, meetings versus the views of people in randomly selected assemblies versus the views of people who didn't show up but are still part of the French people, right? So there are, there are lots of questions. We don't know if this can be done again in France or elsewhere, and we don't know if it can, if it can be done better. But if it were to be done elsewhere again and uh, better, I would. Um, uh, encourage whoever tries that to be, um, um, sorry, I'll skip that slide actually, uh, to be more ambitious. Meaning it's good to try to make representative democracy more deliberative and, and participatory. That's the sort of like goal that uh, Macron and, and we feel set for themselves. But we could envisage, envisage, I think, something even more ambitious at some point, where we drop the track metaphor and we integrate uh, the, the decision-making space and the deliberation in the wild space or structured deliberation space better in, in a more fluid way. Uh, and and that's, that will demand, in part, rethinking our, our concept of uh, who counts as a democratic representative. We're used to thinking of them as elected and, and you know, elite and certain type of people. But I think, to me, the participants in those regional assemblies are democratic representatives of sorts. They have a different legitimacy, they're selected differently, but they do play that role. And so I've tried to uh, sort of imagine what it would look like, and it's not, a terrible, it's not a very good graph, but it should look more like this, you know, more decentralized uh, with various nodes that are um, basically various, you know, uh, open mini publics, mini publics, you know, uh, randomly selected groups of people who are surrounded by crowds of volunteers who want to join and, and, and give input. And they're connected in a way that uh, spreads deliberation much more deeply into what Habermas calls track two. And, and so that we end up with a public sphere that is not entirely structured. I don't think that would be desirable anyway, but a lot more structured. Um, than is currently the case, and, and, and in a way that erases the difference really between rulers and rules, so that we're all, you know, as in the ancient uh, democracy model, in the position of accessing the center of power in turn. So that's, um, that's on the horizon. I don't think we are anywhere close to that ideal yet, and, and a lot more experimentation needs to happen before we, we should probably try it. But uh, these are some of the more ambitious ideas I wanted to, um, to leave you with. So thank you very much. And I think I took a bit too much time probably. Then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And if you would like, you can stop the screen share perhaps. And make yes. somebody else on the screen. Thank you. So now we can move on to Q&A. I believe we have about 25 minutes left. Um, anybody in the room, participants online, please feel free to write your questions in the chat box or just let us know in the chat box that you would like to ask a question. Sorry, hi, Blaine, go ahead. Um, uh, thanks very much for that um, really, really interesting uh, presentation of what happened um, so far in the great national debate. My question um, came up when you cited the figure that 7.8 out of 10 um, 
participants in the, I think, was that, I, I'm not sure if that was the regional meetings or the local meetings or both or online or all together, but um, that they actually found the experience valuable, even though they thought it wasn't going to result in anything. And yes. Yet, and so one question I had was, was there a clear articulation of the purpose of the deliberation? Was it just to bring people together to, to give their views or, or, or did the, the government actually say, we plan on using these inputs in this way and we'll report back in this way? Because we talk often about the need for government to um, be very transparent and accountable for how they use public inputs in order to avoid cynicism and lack of participation in future efforts. And, and also to, to influence the, the actual choices governments are making. So I'm just trying to I'm just trying to put the the high rate of of um, the positive rating for the, the for participating versus the very low expectations for anything coming out of it. And why? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. So I'll say that I don't think the government had any idea what they were going to do with the input. In fact, they had, you know, barely a plan about how to synthesize all of that input. It sort of came, they, they were doing it, as, as, as it was a, in the heat of the moment, they were figuring out everything. So no, there was no clear message. When it started, it was a complete mess. No one had any idea of what the uh, input, gen, you know, gathered would be used for. So I think, it's quite remarkable that people were still willing to participate under this kind of uncertainty and that they were happy about their uh, you know, experience in those um, regional mini publics, even though, again, there was no indication that any of this would be taken seriously or what the format for the, the restitution, as it was called, of the, of the outcomes would be. Um, no, no, the, the, the government didn't do a great job uh, of, of um, trans, you know, there was no transparency about the final outcome of, of all that. They're doing better now with the climate change convention because they said that they are strategically vague, but at least commit to one of two things. Either the proposals will go to parliament for a debate or potentially if Macron judges it's uh, adequate, some recommendations will, or all recommendations or one major recommendation will be sent directly to a referendum. So, I would say that in, in, in defense of the French government, I think there's a, there's a steep learning curve for them because it's not in their DNA. Macron, as a, as a president, basically is a, you know, a product of the ENA, our national administration, which, which produces people who you know, think in very elitist ways, very top-down, very vertical, very vertical approach of, of, of power. So I don't think it was in his DNA to think about participation. Louis-Philippe, same thing, he's more of a right-wing, uh, Prime Minister who believes in strongly believes in representative democracy and keeping people at bay. So it's already uh, enormous sort of a mind change on their part. Okay. okay. Um, we have Kenny online who has uh, um, written down a question. Kenny, would you like to? Uh, speak out your question or would you prefer for somebody else to speak? Hi everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. I can. Okay. Um, so very interesting presentation. I was just thinking out loud on around um, how we can possibly have a similar concept um, in countries where we have government regimes that are not willing to engage citizen groups. In Nigeria, for instance, we have a government that by default are antagonistic to citizens agitating around their issues. So um, how does it play out? Because I, I noticed that for the French um, great movement, the French government played a central role to, um, in a big way, organizing the consultations, the deliberations, and then um, piecing together the feedback from citizen groups. So um, it will be interesting to see if we can have a similar concept play out um, in different places and how this is going to play out. Um, could there be moderations of this concept in such a way that it could be, we could have something similar in places like Nigeria? 
Well, um, so it's a very difficult question. I, I would say that obviously the, the great national debate can only be exported to countries with like a strong bureaucracy, like the same degree of popular political will at the top. As, as an off the shelf solution, it's not gonna work in, in Nigeria, I think. But the lesson that you can perhaps apply is uh, from the role the yellow vest played, because it's civil society ultimately that, that's, that should be credited for this great national debate. I mean, they, they, without, without their demands, without their uh, pressure on government, this would never have happened. And some of their demands were for um, elements of direct democracy, like um, a citizen initiated referendum, like in, in Switzerland, and for mini publics. Uh, somehow all these ideas percolated up from, from opinion leaders uh, and, and people who, who read actually some classics of deliberative democracy. For example, uh, a, a big source of influence is uh, Bernard Manin, uh, The Principles of Representative Government. If you haven't read that book, I highly recommend it. Usually it convinces people that sortition is a good idea. Um, and the, apparently that, that book really was crucial in the... In the in the spreading of, of, of deliberative uh, democracy ideas in the larger population and, and in the Yellow Vest movement. So my, my view is that uh, for Nigeria, it's got to start from the grassroots and from the, the, the social movements. And the problem when government gets violent and, and, and uh, you know, uh, repress, repressive, uh, it tends to trigger the same kind of violence and repression from the bottom up as a response. But what you want to do is resist that and instead spread ideas that are about, um, that, are, that are, I think, better and sort of create a culture in the, in, in the population of, of, of uh, deliberation, empathy, listening. And so if you can't get that at the top, you can at least start to create the preconditions for it because maybe sometime down the line, some other ruler will come that might make room for those things. But if, if it's not already in the minds and, and people are not ready to try it, I think it's much harder. But that's just a, you know, a thought I have. Yes, thank you, Helen, for uh, sharing with us uh, all this knowledge about the French experience. Can you hear me? So, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Well, I was thanking you. I started by thanking you for, for sharing with us um, uh, the knowledge and experience uh, 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 of looking uh, uh, with such detail and, and uh, rigor the French uh, experience. One, one general question that I have is um, uh, when, when you look at the whole process from, from outside, and you see how other European countries have been dealing with um, uh, social demands, some of them quite extreme. It seems that uh, the, the French government's approach uh, solved uh, uh, in, in a wiser and, and, and more open way a, a, a very strong social demand than others. And again, thinking about uh, examples in, in Italy, Spain or, or even or England or UK right now in the UK so so uh, in, in, in your very uh, strong analysis of the French case it seems that this view uh, is is not as underlined as as I would expect it and I wanted to uh, understand if uh, uh, there is a reason for this or you really believe that um, uh, after all, success uh, was uh, there, yes, but there were many other things that you rightly point out that, that um, uh, make the, the word success a little less uh, uh, brilliant, if you want, that, that otherwise thought from, from an outside perspective. The second question regards uh, the, representat the representation system of uh, um, uh, assimilating social demand in France uh, by, again, uh, the mayors, uh, the um, um, legislative representatives, so on and so forth, and how can they, or how, how they have been um, cohabitating or accepting uh, this uh, new experiment and how much this has been really a challenge for uh, one, 
its success and to its uh, uh, sustainability in time. Yeah. Uh, okay, so if I understand correctly, the first question is why I'm so critical of the great national debate when in fact, compared to what happened in other countries, it's actually pretty successful. Is that, is that what you, you asked me? Well, if you see it that way. You... Yeah. So I, I guess it's because, frankly, I, I, I came to France quite enthusiastic and, and really like uh, with a certain admiration for, for, for Macron for, for taking that risk. I mean, when most of the country or country leaders don't, do, do not take it, they certainly didn't take it in, in, uh, in, England, in uh, the UK. But then when the, the, the mood in France is so um, critical. The, the, most people saw it first as a ploy to regain control of the situation as a sort of uh, way to gain time um, to appease the masses and so and anyone who is um, expressing support for the for the for the experiment was seen as like a, a slightly exaggerating with a collaborator so I was pushing back pushing back saying look no it's pretty good look what's going on elsewhere and but it's true that it gets to you after a while and I and I it's, it's a certain culture of suspicion between you know in the French uh, I don't know it's, it's a legacy of history I guess but th there is a a suspicion towards power that's really, really deeply rooted, and so it's it's gonna it's gonna be a challenge for political officials to to convince citizens that they mean it. Uh, and I, and I think, frankly, that some people didn't mean it. I think uh, again, if I have to name names, I think Louis Philippe didn't mean it. I think he didn't believe in it. I think he still doesn't believe in it. He's not, uh, he's actually not giving the, the Convention on Climate Change enough funding to proceed properly. They're trying to keep it short and, you know, uh, sort of uh, under the radar. But I think uh, potentially Macron believed in it. I think some people that I've met on the, you know, in the, um, in the bureaucracy, people who are on the piloting committee of this great national debate, they came in skeptical. They were just doing what they were told to do. And they came out transformed, actually. Uh, I, I can think of a couple of people who I, I met uh, during the regional assembly in Normandy. And they believe, they're believers now. They saw the quality of conversation taking place as those tables, as those tables among, among randomly citizens. And their prejudices about, oh, the average, the average voter, the, av the average French Joe, if you will, they just dissipated. So that to me was you know, really a, a source of inspiration and, and, and gives me hope that over the long term, as we do more and more of those things, uh, you know, the, 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 it, it, will, it, will, it will become sustainable. I don't know how you make the leap when you start from a, from a place where you don't have any leaders to support those movements. That's really hard. Um, and sorry, I forgot your second question now. Oh, well, you got it. Uh... It was about sustainability and how can we make this uh, uh, again uh, get assimilated by the system of uh, representativeness. Ah uh, well, I, then I'd say another good thing in favor of the French experiment. So, for example, when 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 we when this whole thing started in January, my immediate impulse was to say, "Oh, I know how they need to do it. They need to have a big nation nationwide mini public, you know." Uh, a convention basically of a, a thousand people to talk about the issues and then we should, it should percolate down it should uh, be connected to other mini publics uh, in the regions and so i saw it top down but the way they did it was actually bottom up which you know might be the smarter way to go um because you start at the local level you build on the network of city mayors uh, of mayors who again are, are the, the survivors of this big crisis of democracy and you, you build on local um, desires and, and interests and as opposed to, again, doing this very strange thing of starting from the top and the center. Uh, so sustainability, I think you have to win people one by one uh, by doing work at the local level. And, and you know, I, I think we're, we're obsessed with doing things at the national scale, but the, the, the fact is there will be feasible at the national scale if we also, uh, in parallel or even before, start doing things at the local level. Uh, because you need the su support system, you need the, 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 the network of, uh, uh, of decision makers at, at all levels. Um, so that's, that's my idea about sustainability. We have, a question from, we have a question from Atiku online. Atiku, would you like to start? OK. Um, just a minute, please. Let me show them. Oh, 
Okay, sorry, apologies. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, uh, just building on Kenny's um, question, um, I think it's clear that, yes, it's difficult without political will to begin to have this kind of deliberation that happened in France. Of course, maybe it has happened, maybe when we track back and then we look at the 60s, uh, maybe something like that has actually happened somewhere in Nigeria. But I think because of years of uh, military rule, there have been serious regression. And then 20 years down line into democracy, the psyche is still there. But I'm just wondering, I'm looking at um, the movement, of course, of the more open democracy towards what somebody called Trumpism, where they use a combination of um, technically gifted communication experts, people that are skilled to actually sway opinion in their direction. I'm now wondering um, if the political will is absent, and in the atmosphere of that kind of feel, I mean, we've seen that replicate itself around Brexit. Uh, we've seen that maybe in the United States, where the president, I mean, the president consistently and constantly have communication with the people directly to actually sway opinion towards him. So I'm wondering, is there a possibility of actually having deliberation in the wide? more structured so as to actually counter some of this, um, uh, what, what would I call it, a well interesting phenomenon that we are seeing. And if that's the kind of situation that actually happened, what are the key features uh, so that we can actually begin to see as civil society how we could trigger social, social wow. response? Uh, so I, I hope I, I'm not sure I heard everything well, but I, I think one idea that I think is brilliant is this idea of structuring deliberation in the wild, not through government, but through the internal resources of, uh, of civil society. And I, and I don't know how you do that with that because you need, you need funding, you need, you need a centralizing entity of some kind which can uh, harmonize and, and uh, you know, make sure the willing the participants have the same kind of access so how do you do that but one thought i had and it's not it's not a good thought it's just a thought is that you know why can't we have and i think it's life, you know not an ideal public sphere at all but you could imagine creating a chat rooms where you know you click a button and you are randomly assigned to a chat room of six, seven people, or maybe a hundred, and then you subdivide in subgroups, etc., to get a sense of what other people who are absolutely not like you think. So, so that way you, you get to structure deliberation in the world via a you know, for-profit company, so it's not ideal, but it could be done by a non-profit, non-profit company in a way that allows people to talk across ideological divides, cultural divides, we could also do it at the global level, like, you know, uh, you know after all, this, the, there's a community of people um, that could look across countries, across regions, um, and then you get a sense of what other people want in a way that you don't if you only read, you know, your, 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 the papers you usually read, talk to the people you usually, your, your, that are in your immediate circles. So that's, that's a problem with deliberation in the world, is that it's, it's, it's not structured enough, but structuring it through government, if you don't have a good government, uh, and even if you do have a good government, it has its problems. So, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know, but I think this idea of structuring it through other means uh, is a great idea. So, I, so I, can I jump in? Yeah, go ahead. I know we're, we're almost out of time, but... Um, Two questions, Ellen. Thanks so much for the for the presentation. Um, one is, I guess, um, to the extent that we've talk, been talking a lot about process, and I'm I'm just curious what content emerged from these discussions. So, from the from the perspective of this was a you talked at the beginning that this was the yeah. kind of there was a revolt against tax, and then. Yeah. And I was I was skimming a bit the some of the content that came out of the fiscal um, tax and spending um, discussion, and it was just some of it was kind of surprising to me. So just in terms of kind of 
you know, did new, did new substantive ideas about what France should be doing or how it should be addressing some of its uh, difficult policy issues come out and did, did anything, is there anything from that that we can take? Okay, so indeed, a great point. So I didn't talk about the substance all that much. Um, uh, so do you see my, my, my slides now? Yes. yes. Okay, so in the synthesis, so I'll, I'll just show you very briefly how they analyzed the contribution. So uh, they, they analyzed differently the online contribution. So they did some, uh, it wasn't really, a, you know, artificial intelligence or any of that. It was basic big data analysis. So they, that way, they, if, you, if you zoom in on one point, you get to a particular idea. So they managed to keep, as I said, they managed to keep a lot of the ideas, right? They use knowledge trees, which is a, a sort of concept invented in the 70s by a French philosopher named uh, Michel Serre. And so you get to see uh, the consensual parts uh, on topic and then the sort of outlier ideas here. And, uh, and then the little leaves are usually um, lobbies and interest groups that, that very uh, narrowly sort of push for one, one agenda or one set of issues. Uh, so that's how they did it. And then when it comes to the, the, the regional assemblies, they, you know, it's, it's, it's an imperfect method, but the, the organizers uh, themselves summarize the main, main things, right? So on uh, ecological transition, for example, one idea that came out that was quite original was this one. So you see this leaf right there? It says, renew governance to succeed, to, to, to uh, achieve a successful ecological transition. And it's an idea that was supported independently, if you will, by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 regional assemblies. So apparently this is the, the, the slide that Macron or another decision maker uh, saw and, and it's a slide and, and, and that convinced him to create a convention on climate change because it was a combination of the focus on um, uh, environmental issues, a big topic like this. This was really, it turns out that uh, environmental issues were consensual across the different modes of participation and it was a big issue. And we saw it also in the European election that took place in, in the spring right after. And it was combined with this idea that regular modes of governance are not going to succeed in achieving a successful ecological transition. We need new ways of governing. So I, I think the government read that as saying, look, why don't, you, why, don't, why don't we try something new? And something new would be a randomly selected convention of 150 people uh, whose recommendations might be sent directly to a referendum or at least would be sent to a debate in parliament. Uh, so that's one idea, for example, that, that um, came, you know, as I mentioned before, but that, that was, uh, that, that stemmed from that, that uh, great national debate and was not really on the radar of uh, officials before. Okay. I'm afraid we are almost out of time. If we want to take just one more question, there's two minutes left, otherwise. Anybody awesome. else? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, thank you, Professor Landemore, for the presentation. I have one, I have one uh, quick question about methodology. I know you mentioned that you, you felt you didn't learn as much um, due to the fact of a lack of experimental design. And yeah. one of the reasons was a, um, a lack of culture of randomly controlled trials um, so I'm wondering if you were to repeat this process, how you might get around that um, culture and, and what, um, what you would do differently to avoid uh, the sample biases that you mentioned in the regional assemblies and the online platform, um, and also what the controls might look like. Well, it's a great question. So actually, I'm asking myself this very question right now because I'm trying to convince the piloting committee of the Convention on Climate Change to include an experimental dimension. It's not as promising in that case because we have fewer participants, we have only 150, whereas in the case of the Great National Debate, we had 21, we had 2,100 participants potentially. Uh, and again, I'm running into this cultural problem that they just don't get it. The, the people at the CESE, which is the Council, the Social, Economic and Environmental Council, 
are among the organizers. They, they, are, they are people who represent uh, intermediary bodies like unions and they're older, they're not scientists, they, are, they, are just, they just have no idea about the value of this and they don't want to have more work. So they're pushing back. Um, I think, I think, I think, honestly, I think at this point, it's, it's an, a battle that's going to be impossible to win until you change the people who make the decisions or you educate them. So I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm actually at the point where I'm thinking of writing an op-ed to say exactly that, that, you know, every, every country is doing their own little experiments. It's like throwing darts in, in, in the dark. And hopefully when we do that a million times, we learn something, but we could also just use the money we're investing into those things to, to, to do, it, to do a, a sort of systematic scientific study of what works and what doesn't. And that would be much better for all. Um, you know, all countries would, would win. Uh, governments would learn something that they could implement better the next time around. Uh, it would be a good use of public money. So, and, and to the argument that says, look, we can't uh, violate the principle of uh, Republican equality, the fact is that what, what pe people who do uh, randomly controlled trials would, would tell you is that you're already violating, I mean, you're, you're violating another principle, which is that you're potentially harming people using methods that do not work when you could use methods that work. And so, you know, if you split your group in two and you, you make some deliberate along some uh, principles and the other half deliberate along other principles, and we don't know which are the right ones, then it's not violating the principle of equality. We just don't know what works and what doesn't. So, 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 and among the things that I would like to, to see tried, um, uh, I, I think I mentioned some already, is like the composition of the group, uh, group with people that are more educated, less educated, uh, more women, fewer women, uh, but it could also be simply the, the kind of facilitation that's offered. Uh, does the facilitator say at the beginning, uh, to the extent that's possible, you should refrain from, you know, uh, expressing emotions and, and strong judgments about other people's views. Or on the contrary, anything goes and people should be free to express anything they feel and, and think freely. Uh, and what, what would be conducive to better outcomes, for example? We just don't know. So I'll stop there. I don't know if I answered the question. But... Oh, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you so much. The end of our webinar. Thank you for participating. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, yes, well. Thanks. Great. We have recorded this meeting, so if anybody is interested in going over it again, we would share the link. And uh, if it's okay with you, Helen, per perhaps we could share the presentation as well. Yes, you can. No problem. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye.